All right, in this last lecture, we're going to talk about the future. The future of neuroscience, the future of the brain, the future of humans. And hopefully what you've learned about in this course on neuroscience will help you make better choices in the future and also think about your future. So one thing to, to discuss first is really the futurist perspective. Uh, a lot of people are very interested in the future, but it's oftentimes not easy to predict. Remember, the future doesn't exist yet. But people have been spending a lot of time thinking about the future. It's how we make decisions about economics, about our life, about the world. And it's an interesting time when people can use different mechanisms to try to predict the future. So I always like to look back and, and think about how did people think about the present? How 100 years ago did people look to the future and make predictions? Sometimes you can look at that when you look at the future clothing. I don't know, for some reason, everybody seemed to wear the same outfit, maybe different colors in the future. This is future clothing that came out in the 70s, and of course, more recent future clothing. These look pretty good, especially if you like to swim. It's also fun to look at how people thought about future technology. Sometimes they got pretty close. I mean, if you look at the one here on the right, you know, that's kind of a cell phone and you can see somebody while you're talking to them. Of course, you have to wear the funny hat, but still kind of interesting. These came out um, in the 1930s as projections to the future. This one came out in the 1950s, 1949. Now, this is kind of fun because these came out at the turn of the last century, in 19, about 1900. And this is a series of postcards about what the future would look like in the year 2000, 100 years later. And, well, these kind of look like rollerblades, I guess, and somebody's flying around putting out fires. Food is delivered or mail is delivered by these ships. And this is, of course, my favorite. You don't have to study. You just put books into a grinder, and they're fed directly into your brain. Well, we're going to kind of look at that a little bit and see how close we've come and where we're going. Okay, the first thing to talk about is really what's happening now that seems futuristic, sort of the near future, the kind of things that people are working on today. Well, we've talked about this before, cochlear implants. Now, a cochlear implant is surgically implanted into the cochlea, and you have an external microphone that picks up speech, transmits it down here into an electrode that goes through the cochlea. You can kind of see it right here. It goes through the cochlea and trans, really transcribes this information that it's getting from the auditory world into signaling along the cochlea, where hair cells in the cochlea might be damaged, but the nerve cell is intact. So we're using electrodes to uh, innervate different parts along the cochlea. Over 220,000 people around the world have had cochlear implants, and they're getting better. They're getting faster, and they're actually getting cheaper. Another uh, thing that's happening right now is in artificial retinas and artificial eyes. Now, this is still kind of in the developmental stage, but if you look over here, a camera is mounted maybe on uh, glasses, and that transmits as a microprocessor, converts the data to electrical signals and transmits to a receiver. Here's the receiver, and the receiver then signals a, the back of the retina where they have this, this um, really tiny little microchip that is then sending signals maybe to these uh, intermediate cells. It's acting as a retina. And these are working now. They're just getting better and better and better. This one is coming out. And actually, there's versions of this that have already been developed. W contact lenses that monitor your health. They can look at the amount of oxygen in your blood. They can look at the amount of sugar for people who are diabetic. They can monitor your health system. But also, these are coming out, developed, to not only monitor vital signs, 
but they might be able to see in low dark in low light or infrared they might be wirelessly connected to the computer or the internet so you can see the internet through your eyes directly they might be used for magnification so you could use them as kind of like binoculars in a way there's a lot of work being done on these contact lenses and at USC, at the Neural Engineering Lab, they've been working at a substitute for the hippocampus. And if you recall, the hippocampus is for memory. And taking on the role of memory in these microchips, here is a design that hasn't actually been implemented yet uh, of a artificial hippocampus. But these electrodes have been used uh, in facilitating memories in rats. Create a microchip that mimics memory. And in order to do this, we have to work on the assumption that they've come up with ways for silicon or circuitry or computers to communicate with tissue, to communicate with neurons, and neurons communicate to them. And this has been done already. This is kind of a fake mock-up, but this is actually a robot that is steered completely by the interaction of neurons. So let's take a look. You may think you have little in common with this robot, but it is controlled by living brain cells much like those inside your own head. Researchers grew a collection of around 300,000 rat brain cells in the lab. The cells quickly grow connections to each other and start communicating using electrical pulses. When the clump of cells was connected to electrodes, some parts of it were found to respond predictably to signals from the robot's ultrasound distance sensor. The output from these cells can be used to control the robot's motor circuits, preventing it from bumping into obstacles. Because the brain cannot leave the lab, it communicates with the robot wirelessly. The team plan to use their robot's brain power for new patterns of behavior in the future. They hope there are enough similarities to teach us about unknown aspects of our own brain activity. So that really fascinates me, that we really have computers communicating with our own neurons and back and forth. Well, we can also implant. This is called deep brain stimulation. And this is, um, these are electrodes that connect and activate and stimulate different parts of the brain. They can be used as sort of a, a pacemaker for the brain and they can stop epilepsy seizures from spreading. They can act as a pacemaker in different parts of the brain for Parkinson's disease to reduce motor shaking. And it even acts on major depression. Um, there's a company called Neuropace who already creates these, and these are already being implanted. So uh, DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency for the government, has launched a $70 million project to develop an implant into the brains of soldiers that monitor the brain waves of the soldiers. So we can learn a lot about how they deal with stressful environments and even more. <coughs> this is another thing the military is working on called transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS. Now this was originally used for people with epilepsy and to help people with problems, but it puts an electrical current through the brain and in a very specific way, and it actually has been shown to speed reaction time, speed up learning. This is interesting stuff. You can see the application for military, but wouldn't you like to learn faster? Or wouldn't you like your reaction times to be faster? Okay, so here's something that we've been working on in my lab with some success and some failures, but that's the idea of the brain communicating with computers. It's known as brain-computer interface and there's lots of companies that are working on this right now. It actually doesn't look like this but I kinda like this picture. So here's me in my lab with one of my students using EEG. Now if you recall what EEG, EEG does, EEG is an electroencephalography and what it does is it monitors brain activity, electrical brain activity on the surface of the brain. So if you come in really tight, right down into there, you're going to be looking at a lot of neocortex neurons. Now, if you remember, this is how neurons work. They send information and they release neurotransmitters. They send information 
and release neurotransmitters. This is electrical activity. Sodium and potassium and chlorine and calcium. And these positive and negative ions, sodium, potassium, chloride, are creating electrical charges. And the EEG is picking up on the level of activity of the neurons. <coughs> it can look at how the neurons are either firing together in synchrony or firing differently. And another thing it looks like, this is a, at, at continuous brain waves. So what it's looking at is the synchronization, which is this. This is a synchronization of brain waves down in delta. Or a desynchronization, where neurons are not really firing in unison together. And it can monitor those different brain wave activities, convert those brain wave activities into numbers, into data. So here is one company. You can actually buy this stuff. We have this in our lab. And it is monitoring the neural activity right behind the brain, the frontal lobe. And it's taking those alpha activity and beta activity and converting it into something happening on the computer screen. Lots of desynchronization, something happens on the computer screen, something moves. More synchronization, something else moves, something moves in a different way. And what you do through biofeedback is you learn to control those objects by watching them move and changing your brain waves. This is something you can get right out of, uh, off of Amazon right now, a very popular gift. You're simply converting brain waves into the amount of air being pushed to make the ball go up and down. Desynchronization pushes the ball up. Synchronization pulls the ball down. This thing spins around, and the object is for you to make it through these hoops. This is another piece of equipment we have in a lab. It's by a company called Emotive. But if you look, it's recording from several areas of the brain. And now what it does is it records your brain while you're thinking about something happening on a computer screen. You see an object, and you want that object to move to the left. So you watch the object move to the left while this records your brain, brainwave activity. That activity is turned into an algorithm. And then when you want to move an object to the left again, you try to get your brain to think about that. And the computer says, well, that's close enough to the algorithm that I recorded when you thought about moving an object to the left. And the object will move to the left. Record something different for the right, up and down, forward and backwards. It's tough stuff. And we had a hard time with this in our lab, but we were able to eventually train ourselves to move objects. It's not very well. But it makes me think. It makes me think about this. In the 1970s, my, my parents brought me home this game, Pong. And it connected to my TV, and I could play kind of this modified tennis back and forth. And boy, that was the greatest thing. I couldn't believe it. I'm moving objects with my fingers on the, on the TV. But now look what we have. We have these incredible different games with that detect motion, that have such great graphics, such great movement. So I think about the things that are in my lab now that kind of work and kind of don't. But I think about the future and when we begin to control objects much more with just wearing those electrodes. We can control things wirelessly. Maybe somebody who is, who is uh, quadriplegic can move their wheelchair or manipulate things in their house. Maybe it just makes games more fun. Hard to say. Here's another company that's taking that idea, computer brain interface, to a different level. Because there's so much in interference when I put one of those helmets on my head, they actually implant an electrode, a very tiny electrode, directly into the motor cortex of the brain. And then through biofeedback, people move objects like a cursor on a computer screen. So you can see how tiny that electrode is. And this is connected to people's brains, but these are for people who are quadriplegic, unable to move their hands and arms and legs. And they begin to have much more freedom in moving things on a computer screen or moving robots. One of the first animals to have this done was this little monkey here who learned to control a robot arm by just looking at it and receiving biofeedback. In other words, when the arm moved in a direction it liked, 
Well, then the brain began to repeat that because it wanted to bring itself food. It's the same principle that's being done with humans. And rather successfully, and again, we're just at the start. Well, now let's talk about the deep future, the distant future, 25 years ahead, 50 years ahead. Oftentimes we think of the deep future, it's usually some dystopic universe where robots take over and, and, uh, or, or the matrix takes over. And mm, there might be something to that in a way. So let's think about it. Well, the first thing I want to introduce you to is Moore's Law. And Moore's Law has a lot of applications, but this is how it started. It started by a guy with the last name Moore, who was uh, the chief um, operating officer or president of Intel back in the 60s. And he said that what we're going to see is the fact that transistors, the number of transistors per square inch in an integrated circles, circuit doubles every 12 to 18 months. In other words, the amount of computing power within that space will double. That's a geometric or exponential growth. So what he's saying is that things will double in speed and every 12 months. This is back in the 60s and Moore law, Moore's law has pretty much held up. But many other technologies are seeing this. Computers are getting faster exponentially, cheaper, smaller. All these things are growing. Let's take a look at a few, what we mean. Now this is a plot of the number of flops. This is operations per second. And the different computers. And this is a logarithmic scale, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th. This isn't a, a linear scale. This is every time you go up, you add a zero. So a logarithmic scale would be 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. That's how this goes. And these are the different computers, the supercomputers in the world, and how fast they go. And the truth of the matter is, is that even the cell phone you have in your pocket has more computing speed and power than all the computers used to run the Apollo 11 when we first landed on the moon. These computers filled up entire warehouses almost, entire rooms. Now we have these computers with faster, millions of times faster processing speed just in our pocket. So let's take a look at this computer. This is the Titan supercomputer. 20 petaflops. That's 10 to the 15th power. That's how much, how many processes it can do per second. In other words, let's put this in perspective. If you wanted to download the entire library of the Congress, uh, Library of Congress, it could be downloaded in a tenth of a second. This is incredible speed. They're they're actually having to invent new names, petaflop, xenoflop. These are getting incredibly fast and smaller and cheaper. If you look at the calculations per second per dollar, this is the cheaper. This is what we've been kind of seeing, and these kind of go out. And if we look at the brain processes as predicted by some of the futurists, we get up into this area, and this is where we're going. So we not only calculate billions of times faster than we used to, but we do it considerably cheaper in smaller and smaller spaces. That's really Moore's Law. This is Moore's Law applied to the idea of looking at genetics. This is cost per genome. This is DNA sequencing cost. Now when we first started, when we were first looking at gene sequencing, well really back in the 1990s, it was millions of dollars to do the simplest coding. But this is that exponential decrease in cost. Even more, it's actually violated Moore's Law and gotten faster. Now we can do entire genomes, entire genetic sequences of animals for a relatively low amount of money. And this is just continuing the trend. What does this say? Genetics and genetic uh, analysis and coding and changing is changing extremely rapidly. So here's a couple people who think about the future. And these are come some of the books that I've liked to, to read. Michio Kaku wrote a book, it just came out about uh, 2011, and it's called The Physics of the Future, and it talks a lot about uh, machinery, but it also talks a lot about humans in the future. 
This other one by Ray Kurzweil, and Kurzweil is really the leading futurist. This is the guy. This is the guy everybody wants to talk to. And this book is called The Singularity is Near, and it's, it's one of my favorite books to read. It's, it's, it's almost like science fiction put into sort of real science. And he makes, he's made a lot of predictions about the future that have come true, but the predictions he makes about the deep future are really, really very strange. But he walks you through how this is going to happen in the book, and it's really a lot of fun to read. Because he talks about the exponential growth of processing speed, the exponential decrease in size, and now a computer that filled up a room now fills your pocket, and the computer that fills your pocket in your cell phone will soon fill um, the size of a grain of sand and maybe smaller. And what happens when you take computers that are the size of a grain of sand and begin to implement them into the functioning of human beings? He said there's a point at which computers become so much smarter than us, so much faster, so much smaller, that we begin to hit a point, a point of singularity, a point where computers might be fusing with humans and humans with computers. And it's not just humans anymore. It becomes this sort of hybrid. And it's, it's a really strange book to read, but I really enjoy it. So that brings us to this concept of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is technology that deals with very, very small things. At the nanoscale, a, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So uh, this is manipulating things at the atomic level. For example, one nanometer equals the diameter of two or three atoms, which is the size of a molecule or a drug. What if we begin to change things and modify things at that level? So this is a fun website. It's called Universe, uh, I think if you Google Universe 2, but it lets you zoom in and zoom out to look at sizes of things. So let's go in. There's a human being, and then we get, this is on a, a, a logarithmic scale. This is a geometric scale. We get smaller and smaller, and now we're down to human eggs and skin cells, and now we're down to viruses, and now we're down to DNA, what if we start creating computers and robots and machines that work at this level? Well, we kind of already are. We're already developing these things. Now we're down into the atom, into a nanometer. This is nanometer. What if we have machines that work at this level? What could we do with that? So, we start thinking about and conceptualizing maybe machines and robots that deliver medicine in very specific ways. This is a mock-up of what of some robot that might be in our bloodstream that might facilitate red blood cells, might act to help them, might, might substitute for them, might be responsible for bringing oxygen to the brain. What if you didn't have to get the oxygen from the air, but you had robots to do it? Swimming would be a lot easier. This is a kind of mock-up of an intestinal robot that goes through and does surgery at the nanoscale. This is what's known as a nanomachine, functioning machines that work at the atomic level. These kinds of things are, are being developed. We have nanofibers that are being developed. It's a strange time. This is an example of something that's being developed. It's almost like a little robot that holds medicine. These are magnetic nanobots that could carry drugs to the brain. Wouldn't it be nice to give drugs to the brain that aren't poured over the brain like you'd pour oil over an engine, but actually go and target specific areas? These are in development. Louis Pasteur said, the role of the infinitely small is infinitely large. Nanotechnology, big future topic. And now we get into a movement, an idea. The idea of transhumanism. 
the idea of changing the human being, evolving into something else with the aid of technology. Interested in the human condition and modifying it, enhancing it, enhancing intellectually, physically, psychologically, this is a really big idea, big movement. It uses the idea of genetics, the speed at which we are, are processing genetics, the, the inexpensive nature of it, the idea of creating nanobots and nanotechnology that take on the role of our body and our brain, and cloning and other engineering technologies to modify the human being. Ray Kurzweil talks about this. A lot of people are discussing this. Where is the human being going in the next 30 years, 50 years, 100 years? Transhumanism. It's inevitable. So here's when we had to ask ourselves, because this isn't a sudden thing. This isn't one day there is no interconnection with technology, and the next day they are. I mean, we have the cell phone in our hands now, but is that different than the cell phone being implanted in our brain? Some of them, I've seen some people that it, it might be already. Let's take a look at what you would change. What about a knee? What about a titanium knee? Your knee no longer works. Cartilage around it is degenerated. You're 70 years old and you like to walk. Would you get an artificial knee? I think most people would. I think a lot of people do. What about a hip? Hip replacement. You can't walk without your hips working. Would you like to walk? Here's technology. Here is a different machine put into your, into your body. What about an artificial heart? Your heart begins to go bad and you're going to die. And there's nobody on the transplant list. Would you begin to be okay with having a pump that worked on your heart? Hmm, maybe. I would. What about an eye? What about an artificial retina so you can see better? What about if they give you the option for that eye to see in the dark, see farther away, see uh, different components, you work as a microscope? Would you allow that uh, to happen? All you have to do is download an app, ready to go. What about aging? Would you like to stay younger? Would you like to stop aging? People are working on these ideas, the notion of aging as something to be cured or reversed. What if we could do that genetically? What if we could do that n with nanotechnology? We're already making things like artificial skin. Would that be a choice that you would make? Would you like to be stronger? Would you like to be able to hold your breath longer? Would you... Would these changes, or is this too much? You stick with a human, but you keep, your, keep yourself alive. You don't want to enhance. Or would you? What about your memory? What if we could enhance your memory? What if you had failing memory because of a disease like Alzheimer's, and we were able to add components that are not yours? They are electronic. They are microchips. They are... Uh, they're nanobots, and they take on the role of your memory. And they help you to store it, and they help you to transition it from short-term to long-term memory. If you had failing memory, would you consider that? Maybe these are going to be options that are possible in 20 years or 30 years, or maybe less. What about your very consciousness? What if something else other than tissue took on that role? I mean, think about this. Most of what makes you up now the tissue that you can touch and see and wasn't there several years ago. You've replaced it. You've replaced it atom at a time, tissue, uh, molecule at a time. You consume food. You replace things. What's the difference between replacing it with a molecule and replacing it with a nanobot or another or, or a microchip? Um, what if those took on your consciousness? And what if that consciousness no longer depended upon a physical representation of your body. Would you take that consciousness and put it on something else? Would you like that process? We're thinking about ourselves. We're contemplating about our future selves. But what about our children? Would you choose the sex if you could? The hair color? The eye color? How smart they are? What if other kids are smarter? 
great athlete, attractiveness? What if you had those options? This is the notion of the transhumanism, all these kinds of options that will become seamlessly emerging into our life. Where do we draw the line with this? Who gets this techno technology? Um, where do you draw the line? It's an interesting thing to think about, and I think it's going to be less of, of an abstract thought and, and more of real decisions. I'm reminded of this quote, will robots inherit the earth? Yes, but they will be our children. Hmm.